right, it's one of my favorite segments of the week. We bring on uh, Steve Merrill from ProSportsInfo.com to talk the week betting lines. It's week five in college football, and we got uh, Steve here to break it down. We typically go through just a number of aspects of the trends that are hitting college football's uh, betting world, but also uh, the top three games of the week, and then also Steve's wild card pick. But uh, I encourage you to go over to ProSportsInfo.com to check out Steve's work, not just college football, the NFL, the NBA, and Major League Baseball as well. Uh, Steve, how are you doing today? Hey, Mark, doing well. Good stuff. So let's uh, dive into it. But before we do, I always like to get your perspective on the previous week's play and just a number of not enormous underdogs winning, but some pretty substantial underdogs winning uh, across the board when we see Pitt winning at home as an 11 point dog to UCF. SMU jumps up and bites TCU as an eight or nine point dog. Of course, the big one was that crazy game in Pullman where UCLA was down by 32 as an 18 point underdog comes back and wins the game outright. A few other games were in the teens in regards to an underdog winning. Let's say Colorado was about an eight or nine point underdog against Arizona State. So a lot of plus touchdown underdogs winning last week. Yeah, the only game I missed, you know, last week I'd mentioned a three and one in college football a couple of Saturdays ago, and I missed that Arizona State Michigan State game. We talked briefly about it. I knew you were leaning Arizona State there and didn't touch Michigan State this week. And of course they route Northwestern, whereas as you said, Arizona State doesn't play well. So I was a week off on both of those teams, I guess. Um, but it just shows the ebb and flow that you have in college football still in September. And I've always felt like handicapping college football is really four different seasons. Uh, the first four weeks is unique. Then the middle tier, once again, the conference play, you have some stuff to start looking at. And then I love that last month in November when you have a lot of statistics and conference results. I feel like that's the strongest time of the year to be handicapping college football. And then, of course, the bowl games is a totally different beast. And we talk about that every year about motivation, you know, which coaches are still there, players want to play. Um, but, yeah, we're still treading lightly right here in September. It's been a great football season, 32 and 12 overall for my clients. But you still have to take a week-by-week -week approach here because we have very few games, and these guys don't have a preseason. They're still young, 18-, 19-year-olds. And we're going to continue to see some of these underdogs bark in the next couple of weeks. So if anybody out there missed that, 32 and 12 against the spread. So let's see, we've played four weeks. So uh, college and pro, college and pro, college and pro. So right. we played uh, three weeks in the NFL. So that's seven weeks of, uh, so do you try to, uh, do you try to hit a certain number of games to make as your best selections for the week or just whatever your mathematical formula may turn out two games or eight or whatever? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I'm going to play a game that has an edge. You know, if it's if one game has an edge that week, we're playing one. If there's six or seven games, we're going to play those as well. But I am very cautious not to play six, seven, eight games. And the reason being is because, first of all, there usually aren't that many games that have an edge. And if I find that many, then maybe I'm not looking close enough. But the other reason, too, is you just have to have money management and risk management at the forefront of all your decisions. And I've always used this as an example. There are three elements to winning in sports betting. It's picking the right team, money management, and line value. And of those three, picking the right team is actually only the third most important factor. Um, if, you get a, if you get an extra half point or point on every game, you can flip a coin and you're going to make money during the season. And we've seen that, Mark. We've talked about how tight these lines are, you know, and they're tighter than they've ever been. So if you get minus two and a half or minus three and a half, that's a tremendous difference. You can play minus two and a half and then take plus three and a half and probably win both bets in the middle of the game. Um, but the number one factor is money management. And the extreme absurd example I'll give is if you bet 100% of your bankroll in every game, you go 99 and one, you'd still go broke. So you have to have money management. And uh, that's why I don't like to have too many games in a week. And you don't want to expose, you know, I recommend 3% of bankroll. So if you're playing eight, nine games, you've got a quarter of your bankroll exposed. And you're going to always occasionally have a bad week. You just can't put yourself in that situation. So I usually have around anywhere from three to five college games, three to four NFL games on a weekend. Yeah. So to your point, if this makes sense, I've often looked at this because whatever site I go to, it's just a generic site that shows a bunch of Vegas sports books, about seven or eight of them. I've often thought, well, if you hadn't accounted all of them, then you Correct. just take whatever line is best for you. And the, and the lines typically amongst seven or eight sports books vary by maybe a point and a half to two points. So whichever one favors you, probably three to five percent of the time is going to make a difference, maybe even more than that. No question about it. And that's exactly how professionals play. And that's how professionals win. They obviously do have an edge when picking the games, but you got to remember, even the best pros can hit 55, 60% over the course of the season, over hundreds of games. 
You only have to hit 52.5% to break even, laying 11 to win 10. So if you could factor in a couple extra wins because of those half points, and by the way, you know, in basketball, every half point's worth about 3 to 4% because there's no key numbers. In football, it depends on the key numbers. But the difference between 3, 3.5 three is almost 8 or 9%. The difference between 7 or 7.5 seven is about 5%. And Wisconsin last week, it didn't matter. But the line opened 2.5, and, and we did the show on Friday, it was 3.5. And, and I said, I still lean Wisconsin, but I like them a lot more at minus 3 or less. Um, and had you played that game early in the week, you could have gotten the best of both numbers there. Um, so line value is critical, and it just adds to your winnings. you got to pick the right team, but if you get the right number on top of good selections, then you win even more. Steve's the expert. Check him out on uh, prosportsinfo.com. As for me, you can get my predictions, uh, and I would not charge for them. Certainly, this has more to do with exclusive content in the Voice of College Football community. We deliver a lot of exclusive content, including my predictions, in the link in the description section below. We will not talk about what my record was last week. We'll add it all up at 51 and 41 against the spread, which, as Steve mentions, it's still good enough to make some money. But I certainly don't have the money management portion of this down to any uh, degree. So let's look at the three top games of the week. And, and there's no Georgia, Notre Dame, LSU, Texas kind of game that really stands out. It's more or less a lot of very interesting, intriguing, important matchups as teams dive into conference play. But these are the three that Steve and I selected. We've got Virginia undefeated, 18th ranked in the country, have yet to face a real test. They did beat Pitt, who's obviously coming off the UCF win, beat them by two touchdowns earlier this season at number 10 Notre Dame, coming off the rough loss against Georgia, where they kind of proved themselves as worthy of being on the big stage, but uh, still lost the game and maybe a letdown here at home as an 11 and a half point favorite. Yeah, I was actually at the Florida State-Virginia game a couple weeks ago, went up there with UVA alum and insider Josh David, and that was a fantastic game. I went down to the wire, and UVA is a good team this year. A huge flat spot last week, though, against Old Dominion, and that showed they were down 17-0 as a 27-point favorite, struggled to move the ball. They actually got outgained by nearly 30 yards in the entire game, but still won by 11, had to outscore them 28-0 after that 0-17 deficit. Still on the game, though, just 69 rushing yards on 29 attempts. Now, Old Dominion played Virginia Tech close earlier this year. I'm not sure what to make of that. Virginia Tech's looked just terrible overall. Um, I will chalk that up last week to a really bad scheduling spot. That game was sandwiched in between that big Florida State win and, of course, this huge Notre Dame game on deck. Um, but I still have some concerns about that Virginia offense. Now, defensively, they've looked very good this year. They've given up 17 points or less in three of their four games. They held Florida State to just 24, held the Seminoles to just 95 rushing yards. Um, Notre Dame's had some question marks on their run defense. I'm just not sure Virginia can exploit that, though, especially after struggling to run the ball last week. I'm going to look at the total here. It's around 51, which is a very key number. It has dropped to 50 in some spots. I still like the under here, though. I think this could be a defensive battle. And if that is the case, you probably lean towards the 11 points, obviously, with the dog. Uh, this is a huge step up in class, though, for Virginia. They haven't been in this role in recent years. They're a winning program now the last couple of years. Bronco Mendehall has turned this team around. I just don't know if they're at the class to play a team that was in the 14 playoff last year on the road. Um, therefore, I think the total might be the safer play. Okay. We got uh, USC in Washington. Of course, the Trojans two weeks ago lost a game at BYU, but um, have won the important games that they need to win in regards to conference play. Already two key wins over Stanford over Utah, but this time after claiming those two wins in the Coliseum, they've got to go on the road at Washington, a team that took on the same very BYU team that beat USC in overtime and clobbered them 45 to 19 in Provo. So we've got the Huskies as a pretty substantial 10 point uh, favorite at home in Seattle against USC. Yeah. And this line's been holding steady early in the week around nine and a half, 10, not much movement so far in this game. As you mentioned, Washington is a substantial home favorite here. Um, USC was a home dog last Friday night. I actually used them as a selection for my clients. They won the game outright as a three and a half to four point home dog against Utah, a very solid Utah squad. Uh, USC really struggled to run the ball, though, just 13 rushing yards on 22 attempts. And uh, I think Washington's rush defense is actually their weakness this year. So that might not be a great matchup for USC for that reason. Uh, USC is going to have to rely on throwing the ball. And they've done it very well this year. 75 percent completions over nine yards per pass. Uh, but Washington's pass defense has been strong, giving up just six yards a pass against teams that average 7.3. Uh, if if the passing attack doesn't work and Washington tend to can stop the running game, which I think they can, um, you once again might want to look at the under. It's around 59. It's a pretty high total in this game. 
and the USC quarterback situations in flux based on injury, but doesn't seem to necessarily based on the performance of the quarterbacks the last few weeks to necessarily matter. Keaton Slovis uh, gained the starting spot because of the injury to JT Daniels. Now USC is down to a third string quarterback in Matt Fink, but he certainly uh, acquitted himself well against a very tough Utah defense at home. Uh, finally, we've got Ohio State, who's just been rolling, but playing no one. Now taking on a team that we're a bit unsure about. Uh, Nebraska was the uh, Big Ten Western Division favorite by the media preseason, but they lose an overtime game at, at uh, Colorado. They don't look that great in giving up a ton of yardage and points to Illinois on the road. But uh, a lot of big plays uh, probably uh, we're going to witness in Lincoln on Saturday night as the Buckeyes come in as a 17-point favorite against Nebraska. Yeah, and this line opened as low as about 15 just a couple of days ago. Now it's already up over 17, 17 and a half. Very key number, obviously. Uh, so the early sharp money looks like it came in on Ohio State. I, I obviously feel they are the superior team. But this is a lot of points to be laying on the road. I mean, Nebraska will be ready for this game. Uh, their two home games this year, obviously, they were huge favorites. South, South Alabama, they were a 35-point favorite. They only won by 14. Against Northern Illinois, they won by 36 as a 14-point favorite. Looked a lot better in that game. Uh, they've been shaky in their two road games. As you mentioned, that overtime loss at Colorado is a road favorite. And then they barely beat Illinois last week as a 13-point road favorite, only one by four. Um, so they have underachieved. Meanwhile, Ohio State just blowing everybody out. Um, after their a close game against Florida Atlantic, 45-21 in week one, they've won every other game now uh, by at least 41 points or more the last three weeks. Um, that's probably the safe play here. I don't think there's much value left at 17, 17 and a half. Um, but I'm not sure I want to get in front of Ohio State as this should be a very focused spot for him. Steve Merrill on the line, uh, joining us each and every week to break down the betting lines as we look at week five. And uh, Steve uh, chips in with a, an interesting matchup uh, that he's uh, selected after scanning the country. So what do you have for us this week, Steve? Yeah, you know, I mentioned, you know, Virginia struggling last week against Old Dominion. Well, they didn't cover the week before either against Florida State, even though they were seven-point favorite. They won by seven. They had just cracked the top 25. They were actually ranked 25 in that game. Last week, you mentioned SMU's big upset of TCU. They were ranked 25 in that game. When teams are barely cracking into the top 25 for decades now, that's been one of my favorite play-against situations. And even though this is a Big 12 matchup, I'm going to call this one an under-the-radar game just because – the favorite is actually the unranked team, and that's Oklahoma State, currently about a four-and-a-half to five-point favorite at home against Kansas State, who's around ranked 24th or so right now. Another team that's kind of cracking into that top 25 after a 3-0 and straight-up and ATS start. And there's several reasons why this angle works so well playing against these new top 25 teams. First of all, there's always a little bit of a letdown factor by the team because they've made the top 25. They're feeling good about themselves. But I think more importantly, we talk about line value. And when a team like Kansas State starts 3-0 straight up and against the spread, the line becomes adjusted a little bit too much by the odds makers. Oklahoma State, meanwhile, 3-1 and straight up, 3-0 and with a push against the spread. They've actually been a good money team as well. And I like the matchup here this week. Back-to-back -back road games for Kansas State, but they had a buy in between. They'll be ready to play. But I think Oklahoma State will really be ready to play. This is their, only their second home game of the season. They've had three of their first four on the road. This is a real focus spot for them. And I love what they're doing on the line of scrimmage. 270 rushing yards a game, five and a half yards a carry. And they're taking on a Kansas State rush defense that's given up almost five yards per carry this season. I like when I can get a small price favorite at home that's going to win the line of scrimmage battle. Kansas State runs the ball well, too, obviously. But I think Oklahoma State's going to do it better in this game. And I like that play against the newly top 25 ranked opponent as well. So even though it's a Big 12 matchup, I think Oklahoma State flying a little bit under the radar this week. And if the first sample against a good team is any indication, Oklahoma State going to Texas, sure, they didn't win the game, but they were right there the entire game, 36-30 final. They may be the third best team. Uh, in the Big 12 this season. Uh, again, big matchup against Kansas State. Their first test was at Mississippi State, and they came away uh, with a comeback win by a touchdown in Starkville. Steve Merrill, please join him at prosportsinfo.com, prosportsinfo.com, and uh, he will get you all set with uh, Major League Baseball getting to the playoffs, the NBA cranking up soon, and of course, we're right in the middle of the NFL and college football. Steve, we appreciate you stopping by as always. Thanks, Mark.